Okay, our next speaker is uh, John Yasa. He's another PhD candidate from the University of Michigan. You may be detecting a trend at this point, um, working under Professor Martins. Uh, John's been using OpenMBO extensively, both in the version one days and the version two days. You've heard OpenAeroStruct mentioned a number of times. John's the primary author of OpenAeroStruct, and he wrote a version of it in OpenMDO version one, and then ported it to version two. Um, I think John was one of the first external users of version two uh, early on in the development days. So he's got a lot of experience with it, and I, I think he's probably one of the most experienced OpenMDO users, particularly for like analytic derivatives and the structuring of libraries built on top of OpenMDAO outside of NASA Glenn. So um, I think he's going to talk a bit about Open Aerostruct and the, the bumps in the road he's hit there and, and where it's worked and where it hasn't. Sure. Thank you, Justin. We've come a long way from me being called a naive user by Justin. <laughs> I distinctly recall a few meetings where I'm sitting there and Justin's talking to the dev team. He, he's asking them if this is a good idea. And he turns to me and says, John is a naive user. How would you do this? Um, so, so it's been a journey, that's for sure. So my name's John. Uh, this is a, a piece of work that came out of a, a lot of people's efforts. I want to highlight, uh, of course, Professor Martin's right here because I'm in the lab. He helped me. Uh, actually make open air extract happen and then use it in the classroom. And then also my, my colleague Shamshir, who's right there, uh, he was the graduate student instructor for some of the classes where open air extract was used. And so together we've uh, faced a lot of issues and overcome those and kind of seen how open air extract and open MDO can be used in the classroom. So before I start this talk, I want it to be an informal discussion, interrupt at any point. If you can't hear me, just shout it out uh, and we can just talk about it. So my PhD work, as Justin mentioned, does use OpenMDO. I'm looking at path-dependent MDO. I'm looking at a supersonic aircraft, optimizing the mission profile, as well as the thermal system shown in the corner there, uh, and the engine cycle, as well as the propulsion system. Open Aerostruct is none of these things. And so I'm kind of presenting on a side project today. Uh, there was actually a main focus of my, my PhD work in the early years, and it is no longer. So Open Aerostruct, we've talked about it a few times. What does it do? It's a low fidelity kind of conceptual level aerostructural wing design tool. So this neat video comes from work that my colleague Sham did. It's looking at optimizing, so trying to minimize the, the fuel burn for a given aircraft. And you can control the cord as well as the twist of the wing, uh, the thickness of the wing box, so some of those structural design variables. At the same time, we're optimizing the aerodynamic design variables. And this runs relatively quickly. It's not that high fidelity work. Uh, that we've been presenting on before. This again is low to medium fidelity at that conceptual design level. If we, if we show the XDSM for what Open Aerostruct is actually doing, we have that optimizer at the top level, this geometry object which is creating that VLM mesh for the aerodynamics as well as that structural mesh for the simple FEA model. We have this coupled aerodynamic and structural disciplines together here with that, with that solver convergence loop right there. And then we have this functional statement, which is evaluating the, the coefficient of lift, drag, CM, as well as the fuel burn and any other functionals that you want to, that you want to put in there. Joseph mentioned they're looking at the environmental impacts using open air structure. So again, it's very flexible to add in any sort of functionals based on what you're getting out of this aerostructural design tool. You can and should check it out. It's open source, as you could have guessed from the name open air struct. It's on GitHub under the MDO Lab organization. And, uh, and give it a look if you want to check it out. I'll now kind of give a little bit more context about how it's evolved. Uh, like I mentioned, it's been a journey. Joseph mentioned that in 2016, we started out uh, using Open Aerostruct at Supero. And so that's kind of where it all began. I was in a room with Professor Martins and John Huang at the time was a postdoc in our group. I want to clarify one thing. We keep talking about different Johns. I'm John Yasa. John Huang is a different person. <laughs> and so contextually, the John matters. Uh, I did not write the core of this OpenMDO version two. That was John Huang, he contributed the mod theory. Uh, we're different people. Together we worked on open aerostruct. I just wanted to get, to get that out of the way. So us three are sitting in a room. We're talking about what can we do to kind of teach MDO in the classroom. We have a lot of tools available. We have this high fidelity mock aerostructural design tool. That would be untenable to use in a classroom. There's a lot to learn there. You have to install quite a few packages and students don't have the, the HPC access to be able to use that in a classroom. So we needed something new. Our bread and butter is wing aerostructural design. And so we thought, is there some way to make a lower fidelity, a cheaper model that's more approachable for students for, for use in teaching MDO in the classroom? 
And that's where Open Airstrike came to be. So the first version was created uh, January to March 2016. Boy, at the end of that, in March, we had some late nights. I think it came to, uh, it came to the end. It was Justin and me here in Ann Arbor, here in Ann Arbor, here in the States, uh, just working on the final bits of it. We had a really late night. It was maybe 3 a.m. We were at FXB, the Aero Building at UMish. Justin says, John, we need to look at this new Kelly Clarkson video. He pulls up this music video. <laughs> and I say, Justin, we need to focus on the task at hand. <laughs> Um, it, it, was a, it was a different kind of energy in that room. <laughs> but we got it done, or as done as we could. We push it up to GitHub, I bike home, I get some dinner, or whatever that meal is called. And John Huang is messaging us, he's in France ready to do this, this tutorial that you saw the pictures of, because it's 9 a.m. there, right? And he starts asking questions, I'm like, no, I'm gonna bed. So it gets used in Supero, that was a great first start for Open Aerostruct in the classroom. And we were thinking, maybe we can feed two birds with one scone here, we want to use it in research as well. And so we used Open Aerostruct as a benchmark for this AFOSR MURI project. And so that was a project that I was on in the beginning, looking at doing multi-fidelity optimization, also considering uncertainty quantification at the same time. It's this very broad and almost theory-based uh, project where we wanted to bring in all of these disciplines together, use different theories and methods that exist in the literature, and see how they come together. So Open Aerostruct was useful in the classroom, but also in research. Again, this presentation focuses on the classroom usage. I do not want to discredit a lot of the great research that has happened. And it started with that Murray project. 2017 rolls around. Open Aerostruct is being used not only in transfer courses, but now at the University of Michigan. Professor Martin is teaching an MDO course. And there, it's graduate students who are trying to learn MDO. This is a very hands-on way to, to get used to using OpenMDO to look at some different optimization methodologies, some different solver methodologies, coupling different disciplines, writing your own function, and looking at how MDO can be used to get actual physics-based results. It's also used in the aircraft design course where it's a senior undergraduate students who are interested in designing the entirety of the aircraft. Maybe they use Open Aerostruct for the, the aerostructural wing design portion of it. And so it's a slightly different audience there, a slightly younger audience as well. And so that's where we're using Open Aerostruct in, in the classroom at the University of Michigan. We move on to 2018, finally we get this journal article published, it's out there, go check it out. Justin mentioned that we started in V1, I did not explicitly say that, but we did, and so in 2018 we switched to using V2. As a lot of you have talked about, there were some pains associated with that, but, but V1 to V2 was not nearly as bad as V0 to V1, uh, so I'm thankful for that. We gained a lot of speed ups actually from using some of the sparse assembled Jacobians, and a lot of features that existed in V2 uh, now that didn't exist in V1 that really helped us uh, make this model easier for students to use. We continue to use it in these two courses, and at the same time, we continue to use it for research projects. I, I checked recently, I found 23 papers that have used Open Aerostruct, not just cited it, but actually used it to run some results and present that in a paper. And so the fact that it can be used for both uh, in the classroom and then also for research, uh, I'm really proud of that and a little bit surprised, so that's great. I'll now go into the good and the bad. I'll kind of go through the good quickly because that's maybe not the point of this workshop. Well, a lot of us are familiar with the good things and then we can talk about some of the bad. And so I have three main points here and then there are a lot of sub points associated with that. Students can quickly do those design studies that I talked about either from the MDO side looking through that lens as an MDO student or looking at it from an aircraft design student. They can use techniques without actually implement, implementing them and, and sometimes dangerously without understanding them. We'll get to that later. And then there's some great visualization tools for development and debugging, not just within OpenMDO, but also a few packaged with Open Aerostruct. And throughout this talk, I, I want to reiterate, I'm looking at using Open Aerostruct in the classroom, but I want to use this as kind of a base foundation for using OpenMDO in the classroom and what that means. Okay, so the idea is that by having a, a code, not a GUI, but a code, it's very easy to set up multiple different cases you can run, fully understand what's going into it, send that to your, your group mates who are maybe working remotely because they're a marching band practice, and they can bring all that together, and they can look at the same results that, that you're getting in class. And uh, these are just some different results here. You can look at large scale wings, small scale wings, just by changing a few lines within your code by defining a different aircraft wing, for example, and then you know all the settings are the same. So that's one great part of using uh, this, this script-based programming language versus GUIs, which a lot of these undergraduate and graduate students are used to for doing these studies. I mentioned that they can use numerical techniques. They don't need to know what gauss seidel is. Maybe it'd be nice if they did, especially in an MDO course. But they don't need to because OpenMDO implements that for them. They're able to call OpenAerostruct, which internally has these solvers, which converge the model. 
that's just one example of many different techniques that students do not need to fully understand to take advantage of. Lastly, it's been talked about the N2 diagram, a great visualization and debugging tool for students to check out that, that model. Okay, the bad parts. Uh, we've talked about a lot of it from the research side. I wanna talk more from relatively naive users in the classroom and what that means for them. And so there's a, there's a huge learning curve in learning Open Aerostruct and OpenMDO, and let's say you've never seen Python, and all of a sudden you have a course where you need to, to do something in Python, that can be a big challenge. And so that's one, one learning curve that we have to deal with. And then another question that came up often was, where does Open Aerostruct start? Where does OpenMDO stop? What is Python? Is this a NumPy method or is this an OpenMDO method? Questions like that came from students fairly often. And the last one, it's difficult to know what is pre prerequisite knowledge. So do I need to know the ins and outs of aerostructural wing design to use this to get meaningful results? Or is it gonna be rather robust? Is it gonna be able to catch some numerical errors uh, so that I'm not getting CLs of 4.6 and thinking that that's okay? And so I mentioned that it's tough here. We have this learning curve. We have what's going on un underneath the hood, this aerostructural wing design tool. There's a lot to understand here if you need to understand it. And then I mentioned, of course, Python and OpenMDO as well. So there's a lot going on here. If you're a student who's taking four classes and maybe you have your PhD quals, it's very challenging to find the time to, to learn enough about what's going on here. And we'll get to what we need to do about that. If we're trying to use OpenMDO, OpenMDO in the classroom, we need to set up students to succeed and provide them the resources to do that. And so I have some tips and tricks for what to do based on some of these challenges later on. And so where are, where are these lines coming from? We're not sure where Open Aerostruct starts or stops. Where are these attributes coming from? Is that a dictionary? Is the inputs a literal Python dictionary or are the outputs something else? It's kind of unclear if they don't dig into the docs, if they don't dig into the API, what they're actually dealing with sometimes. And maybe they're not sure what sort of docs to look at. And so here's just a snippet of something within Open Aerostruct. We have this compute function here. It's computing the sectional CL for the wing. But if you're just looking at this for the first time, there's a lot going on that you may not understand. You can try to comment it in parts of it, but you're learning code and physics at the same time. And then lastly, this which set of docs do I use? Uh, that's a great question because OpenMDO has fantastic docs, but is this an open error struct function or does it live with an open MDO? Students often are not sure. Of course I am because I, I wrote it and I can use my IDE to search through any part of the code at any part um, that I need to. Um, but they're not going to do that because they're not sure how to do that. And so this leads to my inbox looking like this on the final day of the assignment. And so they're, they're emailing me, it's in all caps, it's urgent, it's Thursday night, I go to bed, I wake up, it's Friday, the day that it's due. Um, this happens often. And so what I, what I take from this, what I take from this is that we could do a better job of preparing students. And so we add to the documentation when we get these questions. We, we take a look at, okay, maybe we had a gap in our knowledge. Maybe we're asking too much of them for this specific assignment and we need to set them up a little bit more. We need to put this, what looks like a bowling ball coming at them from a, from a pitcher on a, on a tee and turn that into a softball that they can just hit out of the park. And so we try to change these docs uh, to kind of think about what it means to come at this from a student's perspective. They don't have this MDO background. Maybe they don't have the aircraft design background. A lot of students take the MDO course from the aerospace uh, department, but there are some IOE people, there are some mechanical, maybe uh, climate and space engineering uh, who have much less experience with aerostructural wing design. And so we need to keep that in mind as we formulate these resources and docs for the students. I mentioned it's tough to know what's prerequisite knowledge. Do I need to know about nonlinear solvers? And if so, how much? What about object-oriented programming? What do all these words even mean? I'm being kind of facetious here, but it's challenging to know where a lot of students are coming in with different levels of knowledge. Uh, for Sham and myself, who actually took the MDO course, I would hope that we know a lot of these things. And so that was, that was okay, but there are a lot of people who don't have that same level of knowledge. And so what we learned from that is we need to provide links to approachable resources, even for things as, as simple as we think, to understanding the ins and outs of Python, for example. This is uh, something I've been talking about. What can we do to mitigate the downsides? Really, it's just everything in one slide here. This is what uh, I'm giving to you if you're thinking about using OpenMDO or a model in the classroom. What should we do? Uh, this third bullet here I think is important. We had a class section dedicated to the assignment. So I come to the classroom, explain what's going on here. We have some FaceTime with the students if they need help installing, if they need help running, or if they have questions about results, do they make sense? Uh, that was really, really valuable as well. And, and this fourth point here is a, an interesting bullet that I did not go into much detail about. We need to choose how much of OpenMDO to expose to the users. So I can kind of talk about OpenMDO version one. 
I hit a lot of the OpenMDO features. You could run an aerostructural wing design for minimizing fuel burn of the common research model, so like a Boeing 777-sized airplane with about 10 lines of code if you wanted. A lot of that inner working of open aerostruct and of course open MDO as well, were then hidden. Which is good and bad. You have students showing up and they say, uh, this doesn't seem to make sense. My fuel burn is way too high because there's some settings set that they don't know about within there. Uh, they kind of obfuscated what's going on there. They were confused about what's going on. And so that's one level of abstraction that we need to consider is how much of open MDO to expose, how much do they need to actually understand about open MDO if they want to use this for something else. And so here we're in this workshop, we're talking with the development team as well as many different users. What can OpenMDAO and the team do to help? One thing that I really like about V1 to V2 is that many names became more clear or more verbose. Went from solve nonlinear, students say, what is nonlinear? This is a linear component that I'm making. Why is it solve nonlinear? It wasn't clear what that meant. Now it's compute, which is general, but it says what's going on. Compute partials, again, is much better in my opinion than linearize because, oh, I'm computing the partial derivatives. This makes sense to me. There are a few different places in the code where that's changed, and I would like to see that more in the future going forward is clear and verbose names. And then another part uh, is the, the interactive diagrams, the view connections, the N2, all these other informative ways to inspect models have been really, really valuable. And then I haven't explicitly talked about this, but should OpenMDO be able to be used by students, sometimes undergraduate students, and maybe first or second year graduate students in the classroom? This is an open question. Should the dev team have these users as part of the, the user base that they want to support? Or should it be the NASA applications team and then other people who are doing cutting edge research as well? Uh, if we stymie research progress and the idea of making it simpler for people to use Open Aerostruct and Open MBO, maybe that's not a good idea. So we can have a discussion about that. I open that up to anybody. Thank you very much. Ironically enough, um, I remember distinctly not only the Kelly Clarkson moment, but the, uh, it's true. <laughs> the conversation John and I had about the difference between V1 and V2. And I argued, I think, strongly and ultimately won for exposing more of OpenMDAO and making OpenAerostruct basically look like a very, very thin layer on top of OpenMDAO. Uh, we've employed that design philosophy with PyCycle and Dimos as well. And, and maybe we need to rethink that a little bit. Maybe I, I hadn't thought about from an outside perspective, how do you know whether this method that you've added to Dimos is an open MDO method or a Dimos method? So um, I think that's an important point that I don't have an answer for, but. <laughs>